Um, I picked this proudly off the LBS website because, of course, this object forms the backbone of our very own school's accounting system. Uh, so, you know, thank you for, for, for that. Um, he well, I was. I think it was a rip off educational version we got. It's quite old. Um, uh, he's seen business objects through good, bad times. Um, the share price, I think, collapsed by 90% back in 96, and then you moved the center of gravity over to Silicon Valley um, and refocused. Uh, and, of course, uh, sold out to SAP in uh, the beginning of 98, uh, 2008 uh, for 6.7 um, billion. Um, and uh, even at that point, he was beginning to, I think uh, the word is, get involved with or working with a number of other businesses, including SQL there, and we welcome back David, our last, uh, last month's speaker, uh, come to listen. Uh, and then in June of, night, in June of 2008, uh, joined uh, Baldism, uh, and that expanded the portfolio considerably more. I had all sorts of fun, as you might imagine, putting these uh, logos down from the Baldism site. So you see this kind of explosion, and it's great to see somebody who has uh, started their own, stuck with it for 18 years, Sold and is now helping so many others to start and fulfill uh, for their potential. So I'm going to say no more, hand over to uh, Bernard, set your slide stack up, and um, you can tell us your story. Um, the business object started in, uh, uh, in 1990. So um, at that time, I was uh, in Paris. So I, I had uh, worked at, uh, my first job was at Oracle. Um, so I, w I was at Oracle in France. Uh, this was my, my very first experience. I started as a pre-sales engineer. I was coming from uh, Stanford, just had uh, studied and uh, did a master there, but uh, I wanted to uh, do something real, and uh, I was very uh, inspired by uh, getting into a software company, and I found Oracle, who was at that time a, uh, uh, a fairly, well, not a, not a huge business like it is now. It's a fairly small business, about, uh, about $100 million of, of revenue global. And it was just starting its operation in, uh, in France. So I joined, we were uh, about 10 people. And then I had the chance to uh, participate to sort of the, uh, the growth of Oracle when, uh, when Oracle went from 100 million to a billion, uh, going from 100, 250, 500, and a billion. So for about four years, I saw the explosion of that company. And, um, and when, you, when you see it from the outside, it feels like it's, it's almost impossible. But when you're inside, you say, well, it doesn't seem so complicated. You sort of double everything every year uh, when you do the plan, and uh, it seems to work. So as, uh, at the end, I said, well, maybe I should do the same uh, and find something where uh, we could enjoy the same kind of growth. And so uh, it was back in 80, uh, 89, and I was, in, I was in Paris. At that time, I was now uh, uh, running marketing for the French subsidiary. And I met an engineer who was uh, somewhat of a, 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 a crazy uh, developer who was uh, working only at night in his attic in, uh, in the Marais in Paris. So he was uh, doing one night, he was doing an astrology program, and then the other night he was doing uh, a few games. And then s someday, for some reason, not quite sure why, he came up with an idea of doing a uh, uh, sort of a, uh, an enhancement to uh, the Oracle SQL language. So Oracle run his little SQL statements, and he built a little bit of a graphic user interface on top of it. And, uh, and he had the idea that Oracle would resell the product for him. So he came to Oracle France, and he said, hey, uh, I have this great program. Uh, I think you should uh, distribute this, this software. So do you want to do a deal with me? And since I was running marketing at that time, I looked at it and said, well, uh, this is quite interesting, but it's very embryonic. There's not a lot of value in there. Uh, but uh, we should, before we, we, we think about anything, why don't we spend a bit of time working on it together? So we did work on it, and we built uh, together a, uh, actually a concept that was much broader than the initial, the very initial idea. And the idea was uh, to propose sort of a, a new uh, interface for business users to access Oracle data, uh, but without having to understand anything about a database, but just to talk to a database using the language of their own business. So in every, uh, in every organization, uh, in every job, you have a particular set of terms you use in your own vocabulary. 
And the idea was, well, we can recreate that terminology for set of users for a department, and that's uh, and, and we'll map that uh, that uh, these objects into the database, and then the users never have to understand the structure of the database. They will just be able to dialogue with these very simple objects. So it was basically a uh, what we call a semantic layer or something that masks the complexity of the database and generates SQL statements behind it. So that was the initial concept of the plot. It's actually a very simple idea. Basically, a business user talks and asks questions using its business terminology and gets uh, all the results he wants. So uh, if you're in, in sales and you want to know, uh, or in marketing, you want to know what are the sales of this particular product for the past uh, year, and you just drag a couple objects and then you have your answer. And, uh, and you can do that for actually very complex questions, but using a very simple uh, graphic user interface. So simple idea with a true value uh, proposition for, uh, for our customers. And then we, uh, we said uh, uh, at that point when we, when we build up the software and we worked with, uh, I worked with the engineer for about six, nine months. And, uh, and then in the meantime, uh, I started to query if Oracle was interested in actually doing it now. And the response was no, that's absolutely not interesting. It'll never go anywhere. Uh, anyway, at Oracle, uh, we develop our own products, so it's a French product developed by an outside French uh, engineer. Uh, no way, we'll, uh, we, we won't do that. So I said, fine, if uh, Oracle is not going to do it, then I'll do it myself. So I, uh, I left Oracle uh, actually with another gentleman who was, uh, I was in marketing and, and product uh, management, he was doing sales, and then we uh, we joined forces, we left Oracle together, and then we negotiated a deal with the, uh, the engineer, uh, the, the, the inventor of the product, because he didn't want to actually join a company. He, uh, he was very happy uh, programming at night in his attic, uh, but he was certainly not happy joining a company and going to the office every morning. And uh, we told him, if you join, we, we're gonna impose a schedule on you, and uh, <laughs> uh, rather not. So uh, we negotiated the deal. It was actually a, a, a tough negotiation, and uh, at that time we had no experience particularly. Uh, we've ne we had never started companies. I was 27 at that time, so it was tough on us. And we didn't have money, so uh, he wanted initially $200,000 for the software. And Denis and my partner and, and I, we had a total of 10000 So we were a little short. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we said, okay, we'll pay you with royalties. So. Uh, and uh, we didn't quite know if this product was going to be successful. In the end, we, uh, we agreed on a royalty scheme, and he was getting 25% of all sales. It was actually quite a good deal for him. At that time, we didn't realize that it was going to be a very bad deal for us over time. But we said, OK, this is a way to do it. Let's start. So we started this way, and uh, we, uh, we went right away to uh, our good, uh, good friends at uh, Oracle. Uh, we were we knew every single person in Oracle in France, all the sales guys and so on. And uh, and on the first sale, uh, we uh, Oracle was actually uh, because the product was running on top of Oracle. So we Oracle was actually doing a um, a deal against its uh, rival competitor at that time, which was Sidebase. So it's two database companies trying to win a, an important account in France, and um, Oracle was losing the deal clearly. And so at the last, so the, 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 the customer I told Oracle, well, uh, you, you, you lost the deal, uh, that's it, I'm giving the, the deal to side aid. And then, uh, uh, and then we came and we, we said to the sales guy, listen, uh, with our proposition on top of your database, I think we can make you win. And we, the, the, the customer agreed to see us almost uh, as a courtesy. And then seeing the software that we had built, so he, he said, this is exactly what I want, and therefore I'm, and since we only work with Oracle, said I'm buying the software. So it was a big win for Oracle, and it was a way for us afterwards to tell the, uh, all the Oracle sales guys, hey, you can win against your competition using our software. We're only going to work on, on top of Oracle. And then we started the company really quickly, the sales really quickly on that, uh, on that idea. So we had uh, Oracle was helping us on deals, uh, on marketing, and so on, and we managed actually to Closed uh, very rapidly about six or seven sales in France uh, and getting an initial traction. 
And that was very important because at that time, again, we didn't have anything. We didn't have any money. We we're not paying ourselves. We didn't have any developer. I was working with the, uh, still with the, uh, uh, the inventor uh, as sort of an outside contractor to sort of uh, evolve the software. So getting these first deals were, 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 were critical. And, uh, and then the beginning, we said we, it, remember it was about 20 something years ago now, in 89, 1990, and we said we have to start the company using the best entrepreneurship model that exists, which is a Silicon Valley one. And the Silicon Valley entrepreneurship model is based on a few principles. The first one is that uh, you need to get venture capital. Uh, if you want to grow the, uh, the, the business, you need uh, financial resources. You're not going to get that in a bank, so you have to, uh, you have to use venture. So we, uh, we went and looked around uh, for venture money, and we found uh, a couple of venture capitalists in France, and we found some business angels in the U.S. Uh, and that was, that was quite important for us to get the, the, the U.S. guys uh, on board. So we raised uh, the equivalent of, of $1 million at that time, back in uh, at the end of, uh, it was beginning of 91. We raised $1 million. Um, the uh, the U.S. Angels put I think a total of a hundred thousand, and there were uh, ten of them investing. So we realized they didn't they didn't trust us that much. And <laughs> they each put about ten ten k. But for us, it was amazing because uh, we were probably the first uh, French company ever, uh, and probably even the first European company ever to receive uh, venture capital from U.S. folks. But we felt that if we want to succeed, we needed to have a mix of capital. Uh, from Europe and from the U.S. because the U.S. market is the key market for uh, for software. So we started with our million dollars, uh, and then we uh, we start uh, building the team. At that point, again, uh, we were just uh, Denis and myself, and then we had the inventor who was uh, the contractor outside. And I remember we had a, a very funny relationship with a developer where. Uh, I would call him and say, uh, you know, in the evening after meeting with customers, saying, "Well, this particular uh, customer really wants that feature to uh, to be in the product, and it's uh, it's really important. We're not going to win the deal if the feature doesn't come in the product." And every single time, he would tell me, uh, "No, it's not going to happen. It's going to take me months. It's uh, impossible to do. It's uh, the product is, is not going to work. It's going to be buggy and stuff. I won't do it." I say, "Okay, well, just think about it." And the next morning, every single time, he would call me back and said, I put the feature in the product, I send you the disk now. <laughs> so, so it was a, a, a funny relationship where he, would, he felt challenged, and then uh, in a night of programming, he would, uh, he would actually uh, do the thing. Um, so that, that was uh, the, the early days. But then after, with our million dollars of venture capital, then we were able to have uh, offices, so we, uh, we rent some, uh, some little office. I, I was able to hire two guys who were working in that time at Bull, uh, some very smart uh, developers, and start building, uh, and start building a little bit of a company, so uh, about uh, seven or eight people. And one key uh, idea there was, uh, uh, A, we need to focus on, uh, on sales and selling, uh, se selling our product as fast as we can to uh, create references. But the other thing also was, uh, we need to prove that we can sell in the most difficult market, which is the U.S., and so uh, we're based in Paris and so on, but we need to set up offices in the U.S. as quickly as possible. We're not going to wait until for for three or four years until we're a big company or a bigger company to start our international operation. We're going to go straight away uh, to the U.S. So after about uh, less than a year, and we were about eight people in Paris, we opened our, uh, our Menlo Park office in California. We also opened an office uh, here. Uh, in Slap, it was with, uh, and then we hired just uh, a sales guy in California, a sales guy in the UK. Both of them we uh, uh, we hired from Oracle. At that time, Oracle was not getting very happy with us. <laughs> uh, we were hiring Oracle people left and right, and we were in their offices all the time, using their marketing resources and uh, their sales database and so on. But uh, it was. Uh, it was a good start, and then uh, and, and that actually the fact that we were in the U.S. Uh, was key to sort of get the understanding of uh, of what the, the the business people and the, the customers wanted there and the different business model. So we we started, uh, and it was uh, the first two years we did um, one million 
one million and a half in '91 was the first year of operation. We did five million in '92, and we did 14 million in '93. So we went actually very quickly, and simply because uh, we had a very easy uh, value proposition. Uh, people understood what we we're talking about. You know, getting easy access to Oracle for your business users. That was simple. Uh, we knew who we were talking to. Uh, basically, the uh, the project managers of the Oracle uh, implementation, these customers. Uh, and uh, we were leveraging resources uh, from Oracle all, all over the planet. And so we started this way, and as you can see very quickly, uh, we, uh, we started. We raised another uh, round, a $2 million round, uh, after one year, and we raised uh, a, another uh, $2 million round after another year. So uh, in the first three years, this is what I call the, the startup years, we focus on developing the product, uh, developing references, establishing our presence in the U.S. and in the U.K., uh, finishing the rounds of, of venture, and by that time we were already, uh, yeah, 15 million dollars of revenue and uh, growing at about uh, 150 to 200 percent every year. And we had uh, about 30 percent of our business already in the U.S. So at that point, um, we feel we feel quite good uh, already, and so. Uh, the, the momentum is, is, is uh, really good. We're growing at 100%. We have 30% of our business in the U.S. And we feel that uh, uh, we're ready to go public. I meet actually in a conference a little bit by accident uh, the guys at Goldman Sachs who said, hey, uh, are you thinking about going public? Yes, we're thinking that we are. Uh, we, we started chatting about the idea. And, uh, and uh, we talked about where would we go public. And at that time, uh, there was very little uh, stock market for technology companies in, in Europe. Uh, uh, so uh, all the technology companies were, that were of, uh, of any size and uh, fame were all on NASDAQ. So I said, if, if we need to go public, and if we could go public, let's try to do it on, uh, on the US market. And so we picked Goldman Sachs. We picked uh, at that time Alex Brown, which was a, a, an investment bank in the U.S., which had introduced companies like Sun and Microsoft and so on. So we built a little bit sort of the, the, the dream team, and then we said, hey, we're going to be the first uh, software company in Europe to go public on NASDAQ. And at that time, we were doing about 30 million, going on to 60, uh, with, uh, and we were profitable, and we felt that okay, we had all the different ingredients. Uh, so we went uh, and we did the uh, we did the IPO. It was a, uh, an amazing uh, an amazing day actually. I remember. Uh, and uh, if you are starting a company at some point, I, I hope you have that uh, that feeling. But we were uh, the IPO happened in New York. We were on the trading floor and uh, the Goldman Sachs office in, in Wall Street. And uh, remember that. Um, uh, the day before we had to price the IPO and it's always an interesting exercise of the bankers because the bankers that's when you realize that the bankers never work for their company they really work for their clients and their real clients are the investors um, and so they're trying to pressure you to put the smallest price as possible on the IPO because uh, that's when the big uh, the, they, they want to please their investors who are going to get profits on the on the first day uh, and it was a time when you really wanted to see IPO pop on the first uh, on the first day of trading. So we had like a three-hour discussion with the head of uh, investment bank uh, of the trading floor at, uh, at Goldman Sachs. If we were going to introduce the the, the, the company at 17 and a half or 17 and three quarters. So and uh, in the end uh, we uh, we agreed that we were going to do it uh, do it at 17 and a half because otherwise there were you know, there were going to be no profit left for the poor investors. So <laughs> we go and then we uh, we set the price. Uh, we set the price 17 and a half. It was sort of on the top of the, the range that we had indicated. And then uh, the first trade happened at 27 dollars. So <laughs> it was uh, it was obviously uh, an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon. But uh, clearly, when you when you're in your trading floor and you you see the the traders who are you know arguing with each other, screaming, shouting, at some point after about an hour of. Uh, uh, Shouting, you see the the, the ticker, uh, the business objects ticker come on the uh, on the tape. It was actually quite a uh, quite a moment. It was really fun. Uh, so that was in uh, in '94. Uh, we had actually a plan uh, our, when we started the company. In our business plan, we had a uh, 
an objective which was called IPO 95. So we, we thought that we were, uh, we were going to give us five years to go public, but we actually did it uh, a bit earlier. So we go public, uh, the, the, the market cap of the company at that time was about, uh, uh, so at the, uh, the, the IPO price was about 125 million. At the end of the day, we were at about 250 million, so we doubled at the end of, uh, of the first day. Uh, so it was a, a fantastic IPO. And then we are we start living the life as a as a public company. So with quarterly earnings and uh, uh, reporting and and uh, and at that time in the company we were obviously growing the business, so expanding the product lines and and especially expanding our, our geography coverage. So going from France, the UK, and the US to Germany, the rest of Europe, uh, building distribution distribution uh, relationships, starting in Japan and really building. A, a, a large organization and with a significant team and it was key there to surround uh, and to run ourselves with very good people so and at the beginning for the first year and a half of our public life everything is going amazingly well we're growing at a hundred percent every quarter uh, our profitability increases to 17 18 percent the market cap of the company keeps shooting up and in uh, 90 at the end of '95, uh, we're at a, almost at a billion dollars in market cap. So we we multiplied our, our value by about ten uh, in a period of six or seven quarters, and we sort of uh, we, we we think that we're sort of the master of the universe at that time. Of course, I mean we didn't know what was coming, uh, uh, and um, and then we're we're going to face a serious serious trouble at that time. So. What happened uh, then is uh, we felt that uh, we had to uh, change our product because our product had, uh, was already five years old. We felt that the architecture was a little old uh, and we need to expand the product line. And we had a great innovative idea is to, uh, we were doing basically querying reporting. At that point, and we said we wanted to do querying reporting and multi-dimensional analysis. And, and we had competitors also coming from different uh, from a different angle and said we need to completely innovate and change the product line. So we go on and we do a big R&D project, and uh, and then we start basically rewriting the product from scratch and building that on a new code and on uh, building it for the new Windows platform. And at that time it was it was a change from Windows 3.1 to Windows 95 and NT with 32-bit architecture. Uh, so it was a big undertaking, and we had, uh, but we uh, we thought we had the best product uh, to come. It was very innovative, and then we pushed all our marketing energy towards that new product. We put a deadline. We announced a deadline about four or five months before the product ships. We said we're going to ship it in April. Uh, we train all our sales guys. We put all our marketing push for ev- all the energy of the company behind that product. Problem is that product is late, uh, and it's very buggy. And it actually uh, only runs on the new Windows platform because it bi- it's been built for that architecture. It doesn't run on the old Windows platform. And the problem that we didn't realize at the time, although we were in window, we were in '96, uh, nobody had installed Windows '95. Because uh, Windows '95, again, I- in order to install it, you had to have new PCs. So when you're a British telecom, you don't change your 50 or 70 thousand PCs in one year. So if you just change software, it's okay, you can do it fast, but for hardware, it takes years and years and years. So we were, we had a great potential product, but it didn't work really well. It certainly didn't work on the old platform. We were way ahead of the market, but we had committed ourselves to a date, and we had put all energy behind that. So we, uh, we make the mistake at that point, and I make the mistake of uh, <coughs> pressuring the development team to the maximum to release the product. And, uh, Product is really not ready. The developers tell me it's not ready, but I was so focused on because we, we were so committed to the market and we we're a public company, so we had you know the investors and the financial community all street telling us, okay, when is the product coming and what is your expectation of the product? And so I remember the last uh, actually the last three days before actually shipping the product, we were still coding, uh, and I was there with the developers all night for three. Whereas I'm not a developer. So, uh, and actually all the developers had left. It was only one guy who, was, uh, who had not abandoned uh, and said, okay, well, I, I'm going to try to help you release that product. 
But all the other ones said it's crazy, it's not working, and we're not working on it anymore. But we felt that we, we had to, so we pushed and we released the product. Uh, great enthusiasm about it because the feature set was great. But uh, we had all sorts of issues about, again, all the things I told you. So the, the customers uh, experienced it right away. And we had a massive problem because uh, all the customers wanted that product uh, but could not, uh, could not install it. They didn't want to buy the old product. The salespeople were not trained on the old product. And therefore, instead of growing at 100%, we started uh, decrease our growth rate enormously. Um, so we had a massive problem, especially in the US, because that's where the most of the marketing had been done. And then at the same time, of course, because uh, not one problem comes without another one at the same time, uh, we, uh, we get a call on, uh, remember I was in an offsite in, in Paris with the management team, and uh, we get a call from uh, our controller telling us that um, there was a, 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 our largest deal that we had done in Germany the quarter before actually appeared to not be a deal at all. Uh, the deal was uh, not a fake deal, but there was a deal with a customer with a side letter of the sales manager saying, well, uh, you can withdraw your order if such, such and such condition is, is not met. Uh, and, uh, and we don't, the, the manager doesn't tell us. And three months later, we're not paid. Uh, and six months later, we're still not paid. And that's when we realize that uh, the deal is, uh, is gone and we have to back it out. And if you're a public company, uh, restating earnings is sort of a big no-no. It's a thing that you do not do. Investors hate it. It, it craters the company's credibility. And, and so we are in this period, like mid-96, where uh, we have no product to sell. We just have to announce a, re, uh, uh, a restatement of our earnings. Uh, investors are furious. And, uh, and we, uh, we face what you just talked about before, which is, um, our, uh, our market cap start, you know, collapsing. Our stock price goes from fifty-five dollars to five dollars in a period of a couple months. Uh, and so all our, you know, our glory and our uh, and, and our, um, our credibility, in basically uh, in a period of three months or of uh, of, of, uh, of time, sort of disappears. Our, our, we still grow, but at a much lower rate than was expected. So about 30, 25, 30 percent that, that year. At the same time, uh, it happens that my uh, partner of the, uh, the early days uh, had decided at the end of uh, 95, being of 96, that uh, for him it was sort of it. He, uh, he, he loved the beginning, the first years of starting a company, taking it public. But once it, it was public, it was sort of the, it was done, basically. Uh, we had done a, a fantastic coup, we had gone on Wall Street, we had taken that company out, but uh, he was in, not interested in continuing uh, the story. So he leaves, uh, happens to leave also at a bad time because the company is, is really in trouble. So I, I ended up uh, the year of '96 with a, a stock price at about four or five dollars. Uh, my partner gone, uh, the investors angry. Uh, remember, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal where the quote was, "Business objects has become irrelevant." Uh, so everything was good. <laughs> so uh, a time are really rough. Right? I remember it was a, it was a really difficult personal time because uh, we we had gone from a, uh, such a high to such a low in a, in a very short amount of time. And then obviously you have company that start you know circling around uh, wanting to buy us. And the company was worth about a hundred million, so we were uh, we were becoming quite cheap. Uh, but I said oh, I'm not going to let this company go. Uh, we have to uh, turn it around. And then I, I decided at that point to, uh, to take very uh, strong actions. So uh, I'm, say if we, I'm gonna say if we, if we want to turn around, we need to re-innovate. Uh, we need to regain the credibility of the investment community. And we need to get closer to our customers and our partners. And uh, one way to do this is to move the center of gravity of the company to the US. So in 97, I decided I'm going to move uh, myself, but also uh, the, the, basically the management team to California. We're going to sort of rebuild the organization uh, in California, get closer to all the you know the core software partners. Uh, again, get closer to 
uh, our investors, uh, because we had essentially U.S. investors uh, on NASDAQ. And uh, they were okay having, uh, having us being a French company with all the, f all the people in France when everything was going okay. But when things were not going well, they had decided to sort of cut all the, the relationship with us. So say we need to rebuild that. And also we need to uh, refocus on, uh, on fixing our product, the one that um, you know, didn't work, work, but also continue to innovate. And that's what we're going to do. A lot of people are going to leave at that point because salespeople in particular, if they can't sell, they don't, don't do their quota, they make less money and therefore they leave. And uh, you have sort of this le lethal spiral where if you don't have your salespeople and you can't sell, you don't meet your, your market uh, expectation, your market cap craters, people are unhappy, they leave, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So this is where we were, but we decided, okay, we're going we're gonna to make the change. The board supports me in that move. And, uh, and then we do that transition, and then we put a, uh, also a focus team uh, starting to work on the web. And at that point, it was like 96, 97. It was very early, but we felt that there was something there that we should uh, build a, a, a pure internet product. And so 97 actually is going to be uh, a work of, uh, of, of, of fixing the company, but in the end, uh, we fix the product. Uh, we rebuild that contact with the customer. We rebuild also the, uh, the because there was also, as you can imagine, a, a lack of trust within the organization. A lot of the salespeople, the employees felt, or well, the leadership, well, the management doesn't know what they're doing. You know, look at, uh, you know, the company is going down the tube. Uh, and so we had to, to do a lot of effort. I had to do personally a lot of effort with the, uh, the employee base. But I gave them a strong direction. I said, okay, this is where we're going. We're going to fix this. I'm moving to the U.S. We're rebuilding the team. Uh, and, uh, and we did it. And we, uh, we fixed a core product. Uh, we uh, re-innovated with a new, a new web product. And we're the first company in our space to, uh, to come up with an internet product. And then in 97, uh, the growth starts to pick up again. We grow at 50%, 98, 50% also. We increase the profitability from... Uh, zero percent to seventeen percent, and uh, and our stock price is going to start picking up again. And actually, we'll go from five dollars at the low to three hundred dollars at a high uh, three years later. Uh, so we are we are moving now to become the top uh, one of the top uh, stocks on Wall Street, based on a fantastic turnaround where uh, the growth of the business is, is picked up. So this is. Actually, I've, I've gone through some of these uh, these phases, but you see what I call the $100 million chasm is trying to move to become a bigger company, but that's when we had the big, the big issue. And then afterwards, uh, you see the turnaround and we start pick up. This is a revenue line here. Uh, and in 2000, uh, we, are, uh, we actually are reaching about 300 uh, or so million dollar uh, business. So things are, are, are good, and at that point, uh, we're uh, in the uh, the world is, is is turning around. Also, this is the uh, the burst of the internet bubble. Uh, but the good news is that uh, Business Object by that time is a real company with thousands of customers, with profit, uh, with a, a solid uh, a solid background. We we shift a little bit our positioning because at that time, all the companies around the world are looking at their at their costs, how they can reduce their costs. And then we shift our position towards, with business intelligence, you're going to be able to optimize your cost base. You're going to know exactly how you can save money, uh, how you operate in a more efficient manner. And then through the tough times, we actually continue to grow, as you can see, a little less. You know, in, in uh, 2002, we grew at about uh, probably 10, 15 percent. But 2003, uh, we moved back up to about 20, 25 percent. So we, we, we still are a growing company, increasing our profitability during the tough years. And that's, uh, I think it's a lot because of the strength that we had built in the company during the, uh, during the turnaround. So we're in 2003, we're about uh, $500 million <laughs> company, a little less than 500 million at that time. And uh, we're at a phase where we feel that we've done a lot of things, but we're, we're still in a, in a very competitive battle. There, uh, we have one other company called Cognos, which is a Canadian company, which is about our size, and has been sort of a, uh, at the same size as us for all these past seven, eight years. And we want to find a way to leapfrog. We're, we feel very strong. We have, a, uh, uh, we have a good momentum behind us, and we feel that we need to do something 
to uh, uh, really get ahead of, uh, of the pack and really win that market once and for all. So at that point, uh, I decided that we're going to make a big acquisition and make a big bet. And that's going to be, uh, I, I had, uh, for, uh, for a few years, I had followed uh, the growth of a company called Crystal Decision, which was a Canadian reporting company based in Vancouver. And they had ups, they had ups and downs, and uh, but they uh, they were reaching about 250 million dollars of revenue, and they had decided that they uh, it was their time to go public. So they had filed for an IPO in the U.S. And uh, I am thinking that th at that time, if we want to do something with them and acquire them, we have to do it before they go public. Once they go public, it'll be way too expensive. Yeah, they won't have the control. It'll be a difficult thing to do. So I, I go see their um, their CEO and their founders. I happen also to know. I mean, it was a particular situation because that company was owned by private equity guys. They had done a, a, a leverage buyout and they own about 90% of the company. So the, there's one guy who basically makes all the decisions for that company, who is a shareholder. So and and the proposition that we offer to them is is basically you can go public in a different way. Uh, we're going to acquire you. You'll have, uh, you'll be a public, uh, you will exchange shares, you'll be a public and liquid stock. Uh, you, will, you will have less of our, uh, of the total uh, market cap of the company and therefore it'll be more liquid for you. And you will have shares in the, num in the clear number one in the space as opposed to be the number four in the space. So uh, let's try to do that and you're not going public. The guy says, okay, but uh, I'm not derailing my public offering, so you have to put a deal together in five weeks. Uh, between now and uh, the roadshow. So we scramble and in the end we managed to get a deal with them uh, where we buy the company for about a billion dollars but at that point we were worth about two and a half. Uh, we take about 35% of the company to make it happen but in the end we end up with a company that is uh, about 750 million dollars of revenue and then we're going to embark in a big integration. We do so, and as you can see, uh, 04 just shows that the, uh, the inorganic growth of the company, we're now a, 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 large, a large company, but as, as you can see afterwards, uh, we're going to uh, expand the company organically from that particular size and, uh, and grow and maturate the business. Because now we're the clear leader in the space, uh, the space we have pioneered that space for about 12 years, 15 years or so. It's become the first priority of CIOs. Everybody wants to have business intelligence, and uh, we're reaching uh, actually mostly organically afterwards a billion dollar and a half of revenue at the end of 07. So by doing a great acquisition, by taking a huge bet in the, in the 03, you see that we're changing completely the dimension of the company, and we take ownership of the space. And in, uh, and in 2007, in the summer of 2007, the market is, is uh, so visible that uh, the large players, the largest players in the space, uh, in, in software, are starting to get really interested. And uh, in the summer of 07, SAP and IBM come to us at the same time. We, were, we didn't solicit them, but they came at the same time saying, we want to uh, discuss a strategic combination with you. <laughs> uh, strategic talks. So we know what it is when, they, when a big company wants to have strategic talks with you. Uh, and so we, uh, uh, we first talk with each of them separately. Uh, and, but then afterwards we realize that uh, there's, a, there's a real possibility here. Uh, they are really serious. Uh, Oracle uh, had actually approached us a year before uh, we had said no because they proposed a price that was too low. Uh, and they bought another company, they bought Hyperion at that time, and so the market is really heating up. Uh, the two companies uh, have come to us, and w uh, after about a month of discussion, we tell each other, well, uh, we're interested, uh, but you know, you have a competitor, and so we're going to put you in a process, and uh, we want you to. Uh, uh, put your offers at a particular day, and uh, and we'll pick the better one. And in the end, uh, in the end, uh, SAP comes with a better offer. Uh, they propose a price which is roughly about 30, 40 percent above our 
market cap, which by then was already a bit inflated because uh, there was rumors on the market. Uh, and we sell uh, the company for uh, $6.8 billion and the uh, third largest acquisition at that time. And then we integrate the two companies afterwards. So that's sort of the, uh, the, the end of the story at that point uh, of Business Public as an independent company. Uh, it was a friendly acquisition, um, putting two, two uh, great companies together, and now it's working <coughs> out pretty well. Just a couple things that I want to say in terms of key success factors, which I think made us, uh, made us work well. One is this concept of value innovation, meaning that uh, it was truly an innovation when we started, but we could explain the value proposition uh, very simply to our customers. And we create a brand new market, this sort of concept of the blue ocean that I'm sure you know about. Uh, the second thing was the model. Uh, we followed a, a, a proven entrepreneurship model, uh, which was uh, you attract uh, uh, financial resources from venture capitalists, you attract human capital with uh, putting in place stock option plans and making them participate in the equity. And now it's, ob it's obvious, but at that time it was very new, uh, especially in, in, in Europe. And you shoot for an IPO to uh, get the, uh, the returns for the employees and for the, uh, the shareholders, the investors. Go Global, so the transnational model was very important in our culture. Is uh, Go Global very early on, with, I think we're the company that went the fastest uh, from Europe to the US, and we created a, a transnational organization from day one, uh, being in the US, whereas we were less than 10 guys in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and we brought transnational money and board and management, uh, again, from the US, from Europe, very early on. And, uh, and we developed uh, uh, our company a lot in the US and went public on NASDAQ. Find a better place to go public, whether it's in uh, France or in the US, it doesn't matter, uh, take the better place. The culture of passion was very important. Uh, we were all aligned behind this culture of competition, being number one, being aggressive, uh, very driven uh, culture all around the globe. All around the globe. Uh, and at the same time, what I call the Darwinian organization, meaning being able to evolve your organization extremely quickly uh, with the environment. Uh, when we started, uh, we were a French company. When we realized that we needed to go global, we went right away. Uh, when we had to shift the, uh, the center of gravity, we did it. Uh, we didn't stay with a <coughs> monolith uh, kind of company. And I mentioned just uh, what we did in R&D. Um, in four years, we went from a uh, situation where we had 400 people, all of them in Paris, to 1,600 people just in R&D, where uh, only 25% uh, of that organization was in France. We completely changed with uh, people in India, people in Canada, people in, uh, in China. So it was a time when we needed to have, uh, to take advantage of, of a talent pool, of a global talent pool. We didn't hesitate to completely uh, change the fabric of the organization at that time. And I think that uh, that helped us quite a lot. I think I'm gonna stop here because uh, I wanna leave uh, some time for questions. And uh, I'll be happy to also a few words about uh, what I'm doing now, but I feel that uh, I should probably uh, wrap up at this time. I'd like to ask just one other people get the questions together. I'd like to ask, I mean, you took it public, <coughs> took it public in, in, um, in after that five years, yeah. and then it seems to me that you made a product that was late, buggy, and for uh, obsolete, or, or for a, a yet-to-come platform, yeah. and those are pretty obvious mistakes. Um, as, as you said them. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, what I'm really asking is, was the fact that you went to IPO and you were a public company with all those pressures on, did it kind of dent your judgment uh, because you were playing to somebody else's tune rather than your own tune, which had guided you so well in the first few years? Was it a mistake to go public, uh, apart from the virility thing? No, I don't think it was a mistake to go public. I think uh, the going public gave us the, uh, the aura and the, uh, the credibility and the visibility that was key in order to grow the business. Uh, there were lots of deals that we couldn't do before we were public. We were still, initially, we were still viewed as this neat little French company. Uh, and we couldn't really deal with uh, the US government, uh, with very large US companies. I remember having a American Airlines threw us out and after, after 15 minutes of demo saying, you're obviously a French company. 
Because we were, we, were, <laughs> we were sort of hiding. If I, I remember at the beginning, um, uh, I mean, even in France, the French the customers were not used to buying from French software companies. So uh, they, they, uh, they were asking all sorts of questions about our, our, our US presence. And, uh, and they are asking all sorts of questions about um, how big we are. And uh, so to a French customer, I would say, because we were like five the beginning. So we're saying, how many people are you in the company? We're five in France. <laughs> implying that there was this gigantic corporate headquarters in, in California where there were hundreds of people. But, um, no, I mean, I think uh, it was important to go public uh, to establish the credibility, and it helped a lot in the business. However, it's true that I think uh, we're still very young at that point, and then we were, we were all, to some degree, overwhelmed by the pressure of Wall Street. And we were so focused on meeting our expectation, uh, exciting the, uh, the investors for the next quarter, because you have to give guidance next quarter. So we, we were sort of carried by you know, 100% growth, the increase of profitability, meeting the expectation. If we say something, we have to make it. And I think the big mistake was to uh, not take a step back and say, OK, well, the product is not going to uh, happen. It's going to be late. And we'd better say it's late uh, and release it six months down the road than to uh, to back to the pressure. Yeah. Please, yes, Karen. Yeah. Uh, you said uh, you raised uh, $1 million uh, initially, and uh, it was uh, about uh, 900,000K uh, from uh, venture capital and the remaining from the business en uh, angels. Generally, business angels uh, try to invest in their own backyard. I mean, how did you? How how easy it was to get the capital, and what was the initial valuation at the time? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, it was hard to raise the first. Uh, I think. Uh, I mean, the, the reason why we managed it because we I had a personal connection in the U.S. Uh, and that person was a uh, he was actually a board member of Oracle at that time. Uh, and he had so a lot of experience in the space. He was a venture capitalist himself, and he he, uh, he said, "Hey, why not uh, why not try?" And he and he talked to uh, his buddies basically, and he says, "You know, ten thousand dollars. It was like pocket change for them." <laughs> the, but that 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 gives you the sort of the trust they had. It was basically, well, if you know this guy has invested, I'll I'll support him. I don't know about these French guys, but you know we'll we'll do it anyway. But. Uh, but it was key because uh, the fact that we had the Americans helped us getting the uh, European uh, VC money, because otherwise we uh, we had uh, we were also risky, not management experience, and so on and so forth. So it was quite important. Uh, we uh, because we had all, all these you know no experience and so on, we got crushed on valuation. So we raised um, we raised one million dollars on a pre-money valuation of about one point five. So that was probably my, my biggest. When I think about it, I said, shoot, because <laughs> that's that's when I lost uh, a, a lot of the equity of the company. I mean, they they got basically almost forty percent of the company uh, on day one. But again, at that time, uh, I had never managed more than one and a half people at, at Oracle. Uh, so it's like, who are you? <laughs> Just a follow-up question on uh, that. Well, can, can we leave, because there's loads of other questions here, so let's move on. Yes, you are next, and then. When you started in 89, did you have a vision of the scale when you ultimately exited? Because it plays like an almost sort of inevitable conclusion. And also, were you not tempted to kind of get off the train at any point? I mean, after you IPO'd, et cetera, you must have had a number of opportunities to kind of go, actually, this is, this is hard going. I'm just going to call it a day. No, at the beginning, I had no idea. To be honest, uh, I think it'd be a good lie to say otherwise. I mean, I, we we had a business plan, uh, and the business plan was a five-year plan that took us uh, all the way to about 50 million. Uh, and but in the end, I think uh, when I look at where we were five years later, we actually arrived at uh, at, at we thought we would arrive. So at, at about five years down the road, we we went to a, a slightly different growth curve. But in the end, that's where we were. But Going beyond that, no, we had no idea where it would go. Afterwards, I think, you know, uh, at some point I, I had doubts of my ability to take the company further. 
but uh, to me, I mean, I'm uh, contrary to my partner who was more like, when it was when it was public, it was sort of you know that's it. I I felt that it was the the the, the path beyond that was going to be very uh, potentially very exciting. Uh, and the, the way to do it was always to look into the future, say, okay, what are the what are going to be the next three years? What can we so to take it a step at a time uh, and say, well, the, the the next three years we think we can get to here. So when we're at 50 million, say, okay, how can we get to 150 million? And when we're past 100 million, how we can get to 300 million? Uh, and then so it becomes more possible. But it's true, I had some doubt at some point, but the experience was amazing in, in so many ways. Uh, but when we went down and the stock price was at five, it's true that uh, I had a lot of doubts and uh, I was not sure that uh, the board was going to support me or the management team was going to support me. In the end, they did and it was key. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience. Um, I'm a young entrepreneur and one problem I face is the lack of credibility. Um, do you have any advice or suggestion how to get over it? When yeah, you what do you hear that? Advice on how to get over the credibility gap when you're when you're starting out? Well, I, uh, it depends. I mean, the lack like of credibility could either be your investors or maybe your ecosystem. Investors, in general. customers, um, both. Yeah, I think. I mean, it, this is something obviously that we all face at the beginning. So. You need to uh, to be and, and and feel extremely professional and uh, and feel that you are uh, you're very much in control of what you propose. Meaning that uh, what to me is that uh, where where customers start to feel uneasy is if you if you go in many different directions at, at the same time. But if you if you have a very clear value proposition, you can articulate it. You say this is what I'm doing. I'm not doing 15 other things. Uh, this is the value that you can get out of me, uh, and um, and you speak very intelligently about what you do. I think you can get over the hump because uh, you. We started. We were 27. We didn't have any experience. We did it, and we were selling to very large companies. But it's it's the the, the quality of your offering and the clarity of your articulation, which I think is going to is going to be important. The other thing is that surround yourself with great people, and if if credibility is important, then. Yeah, try to get investors around you, uh, and try to get a good management team around you. Uh, if you have that, then you will, it will carry you forward. Uh, I would be very interested in hearing what kind of skills you used in the early years, and then whether you needed to build on new ones. Because, well, you said you started too early, or you were so young when you started, and you didn't have management experience or managing business experience. So. What, what core strengths you use in building the business and then maybe turning around it? I, I, it's true, at different times of the company you use <coughs> different things. At the beginning, uh, it's really the focus uh, that you, 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 you spend your time on. It, it's, it's making sure that you, you really understand what you're doing. Uh, you're, you're one day uh, be a sales guy in front of a customer. The other day you have to work fairly deep in technology with the, uh, the, the, the developers. Uh, another day you have to write a marketing brochure, you have to help the team. So uh, you need to, uh, A, uh, be quite deep and exercise your, your, your ability to, uh, to um, I would say, to, yeah, to be deep in every single uh, aspect of the company because you want to make sure that the company is at the level of quality that is needed, in particular for the credibility. It needs to feel high quality, highly professional, because every other thing goes against you. You're small, you, you have no experience, uh, you're unknown, et cetera, et cetera. So focus on, on that, and that was that's important, is, is, is exercise the skills of uh, professionalism and, uh, and, and the technicity in every single thing that we're doing. Afterwards, it's, uh, you're scaling the business, so it's uh, it's hiring people. So uh, being able to inspire or, or to attract great great folks, so that uh, you're going to have the best salespeople in the U.S. and uh, the, the great guy, the great head of R&D, and then so uh, making sure that you you carry your your passion when you uh, when when you talk to these uh, these hires and you're ready to hire the best people, even if these people look and, and are much better than you are. And that's probably the most important thing, is surround yourself with people who are, all of them, two or three times better than you are. 
and they're no, they're not going to threaten you. They're going to carry you up. If you don't, the, 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 the lack of quality of your team, if you think, well, I'm, I'm not going to hire someone too good so that I can control it, it'll push you down. So you, the team is going to make the, the, the company forward. And then, the last, and then afterwards, I think, well, I could go through all the phases, but then afterwards you, you start becoming a true leader, and when you become a true leader, the, the, what you focus on is different. It's, uh, it's setting, to me, the leadership is setting the magnetic north, basically, this is the direction we're going. And you need to communicate that to everybody in the company so that they can do their work without you telling them what to do. <coughs> because uh, when they uh, you know, raise their head up and they look, okay, this is where we're going, so I'm going this way. That's one. The second is that you need to inspire people to do better than what they think they can do on their own. So inspire them to sort of do the extraordinary uh, so that they feel by themselves that they want to work super hard to get to a particular objective. And the third point, in my opinion, is to set an example. You need to be yourself the embodiment of the culture and what you're trying to uh, push forward in your company. If you do these things, to me, th these are the other skills that you need when the company has already you know, hundreds or thousands of people. You don't have the touch anymore, the, the, the direct touch with the, with the people. Okay, I think we'll have time for one other question. So, yeah, hey. Manon, how did you get out of the noisy agreement with the crazy developer? Oh yeah, ah, thank you. <laughs> Great one to end on. That's, uh, that's a good story, actually, because we um, we were suffering from that, of course. So we had our twenty-five percent royalty, who was uh, was quite heavy. I mean, it, it was not heavy for him because the uh, the check every uh, every quarter was quite quite good. <laughs> Uh, but as we were progressing towards uh, the idea of an IPO, we couldn't, uh, you know, investors were very clear, so you, you can't go public with 25% of uh, cups of license, you know, uh, it's not going to work, you're never going to be profitable. So, uh, but we didn't really have a good, uh, good argument with him, because uh, we had an eight year long contract, I mean, the, the royalties were coming down, but very slowly. So uh, we were thinking about that with, uh, with my friend Denis, and, uh, and by that time, Jean-Michel, the, the, the developer, already he had moved out of Paris, he had built a nice you know, house <laughs> in, in the south of France, you know, he, he, was, he had a like, big motorbike and he was living the life, so there was no particular reason for him to change what he was doing, so we were scratching our head, and at uh, that point we were... Uh, we had, um, we had different kinds of royalty schemes. So we had the DOS, MS-DOS royalty, 25%, Windows, 12.5%, and Unix, like a Unix workstation, 0%. So uh, we go to him, we go, we fly down the south of France, and we sit down and say, hey, Jean-Michel, we need to talk to you. Uh, and we said, well, first of all, we had our idea, which is uh, we, we have to cut the royalties completely. Uh, we're going to, what we're going to give him is 1% uh, of the company and we're going to give him a lump of cash right away. So we feel that, we hope that a pack of money on the table now, you know, ahead of all the royalties and 1% of the royalty was going to be good enough. But uh, we explained that to him and he says, well, no, I'm very happy, I'm a motorcycle, big house, uh, uh, I don't have to worry. So, um, well, we said, okay, well, but we're not going to continue because uh, we're going to be unprofitable. The company is going to die, and therefore we're not going to do. We're not. We're going to discontinue MS DOS. We're going to discontinue uh, Windows. We're going to focus all our efforts on Unix. Obviously, nobody wanted to focus their on Unix because there was no market in Unix workstations for the iPods. But we had to sort of push the envelope. So we explained all this, and said, "Oh, okay, maybe." And then we have lunch. And then uh, his wife uh, arrives and uh, puts some stuff on the table and says, okay, what is this thing? What is, uh, so what do they want? And he started explaining to her what we had told him, and basically saying, well, they want to not pay us anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> and he said, well, no, then, then we're not taking the deal. Uh, and so we spent the whole lunch re-explaining it to his wife, and we realized that he was not the one making the decision. <laughs> <laughs> he was. Uh, but then after a bit of wine, a bit of good food, she said, okay, and then we closed it the other way. Right now, uh, what I'm doing is I'm, uh, I join a venture capital firm called Balderton Capital. Uh, Balderton is a, a fund that was initially the European arm of Benchmark Capital in California. Uh, but since then, uh, about three years ago, we became independent, so we changed our names. 
We manage today about two billion dollars in uh, uh, in capital. We have four funds. Uh, the, three, the first three funds are fully invested. The fourth fund we raised last at uh, the end of last year about 480 million. And so we invest in small high tech firms, uh, like you know I, I was eight, 20 years ago. <coughs> and so you see some of the companies that uh, we've had here, and we've had a great uh, track record. We you see the red ones are the IPOs. I'd like to thank you very much. Terrific, uh, terrific uh, story of so many years.